What's up, y'all? Welcome to the ultimate Does It Frickin' Matter for Hypertrophy tier list. So, there's gonna be five tiers, absolutely crucial, pretty important, kind of a thing, meh, and five, who cares? So those should be pretty self-explanatory, ranging from most important to least important. Also keep in mind, this is just my opinion, but it is based in research and based with talking to a lot of people. It's not just me sort of going to the gym and finding what works for me. It's based on a lot of information, but it could be slightly different for you. If I write something in as a five for you, maybe it's a four. If I write something in as a one, maybe for you, it's a two, but it will probably be fairly close. All right, so let's get into it. Let's start at the bottom so we can build some suspense. Number one, Stretching, and this is in the who cares category because it doesn't have a direct impact on hypertrophy. It might feel good, it might be something that you enjoy doing, but don't think that you're actually building muscle when it comes to stretching. You could have the logic of, oh, it helps you improve your mobility, which helps range of motion, which helps trigger muscle protein synthesis, which helps build muscle, but directly it doesn't really do anything at all. Next one, testosterone. Now I know some people are gonna be absolutely up in arms, Number five, testosterone. I'm talking about in the natural range. If you're super low for whatever reason, correcting that issue, you might see some results. If you're at like 100 nanograms per deciliter and you get that back into, you know, 400, 500, 600. Oh, Russell, gonna get higher and higher. Sure, that actually does matter, especially if that motivates you to actually train. Plus, if you are injecting a bunch of steroids, you know, you're taking a couple grams a week or something. Not telling you you should use it, just saying it would clearly help a lot if you did, okay? Yes, that kind of super physiological level can have a huge difference. But a 10 or 20% swing, which is what most test boosters are gonna give you, if anything at all, will have absolutely no impact on muscle growth. So in terms of this actually impacting your results, a zero. The next one, tempo. So this is the idea that you spend a certain amount of time lifting, a certain amount of time paused, a certain amount of time lowering, a certain amount of time paused at the bottom position. This is not only who cares, this is probably actually counterproductive, okay, for a few reasons. First, it's a pain in the ass to do. Have you ever tried to lift hard and heavy and yet you're counting the number of seconds that it takes to lift it? Not a great idea. Second, it has really no benefit at all. Third, it's probably counterproductive because if you're trying to lift slowly, you're gonna recruit fewer muscle fibers than if you are lifting more aggressively because you're producing less force. There's less power output actually required. Fourth, it will prevent you from going to failure. If you can't lift the weight in four seconds and that's your failure, well, you could have done more if you chose a more reasonable and natural and fluid tempo. So I would say focusing on tempo training is something that is not only who cares, this is tier six. This is actually counterproductive. Next up, we have the pump. Well, it might feel good. It might feel really good to some people. And aching and just think go on. Coming, and coming, and and coming. And on and this doesn't really have a dramatic impact on muscle growth, and it's not really worth chasing. If you have to go out of your way and change factors in one, two, and three tiers in order to get a pump, it is almost certainly counterproductive. Yes, you can get a pump with, you know, pumping up the pink dumbbells, but that doesn't mean it's gonna do anything for muscle growth. Plus, a lot of very effective training protocols don't give you a pump at all. So I would say, especially if you're a natural, the pump can be used as a proxy for, you know, what muscle you're actually working. If you're getting a pump in your biceps, you know, you're obviously working your quadriceps, no, your biceps. So I would say this isn't directly useful, but it might be useful as a proxy. Getting into tier number four, we have recovery. And I don't mean recovery in a general sense, I mean specific recovery products or protocols. So massage guns, chirotherapy, foam rollers, this kind of thing. I put this in four because it does have an impact, but it is almost always quite minor. Plus, a lot of the people I see hyper-focusing on recovery products, they are not taking care of the stuff in tiers one, two, and three, which are gonna be much, much more important. The vast majority of people who are using these recovery products, they don't have anything to recover from. So unless you're an elite athlete, this is almost certainly meh. 
And every week I get people emailing me about recovery products, wanting me to plug them in a video. So this is me plugging them in a video. Meh. Next we have meal timing. So after the workout or how many meals you're eating per day, this is just not important unless you are fucking it up on a grand scale. So if you're only eating once per day, yes, that will impact your results just because you're not getting in enough muscle protein stimulating occasions. But I would say if you're eating at least three times per day and you're getting in at least 30 grams of quality protein every single feeding, past that, it's not going to be that important. It might have some minor benefit going to four or five feedings per day, but again, it's going to just be minor. Periodization. Now for strength training, periodization would probably be a two or even a one. It is very, very important. But for just general hypertrophy training, periodization is not that important. There's really no need to take you know, a month of doing this kind of training, then a month of this kind of training, then a month of this kind of training, and, and undulating your rep ranges and changing your exercises all the time. Not really. That is not really a thing. It might have some relevance if you're very advanced, but for the vast majority of people, not worth focusing on. Intensity. So by intensity, I don't mean intensity. I mean intensity, just percentage of one rep max. So 90% intensity in the barbell back squat is 90% of your one rep max. The reason this is at meh is because you can gain muscle on a very, very wide range of intensities. So as low as around 30% of one rep max, which I wouldn't really advise because it's horrible to actually do that to failure, up until 80%, 90%. You could even probably gain muscle at 95% of one rep max. You would just need to do a whole bunch of singles. I would say optimally 60 to 80%, somewhere in that range, but it's pretty flexible. And most people aren't really messing this up very badly because it's very, very hard to do. A training partner. So a training partner might help. They might help to motivate you if that's an issue. They might help to spot you on the bench press or, or some other lift. But I would say for the most part, this is certainly not required. They might have a minor impact, but if they have a huge impact, your head is probably not in the right place. If you can't train without your workout partner or something like that, what's up with that? Can't do leg day without my bro to slap my honey buns before my squats. Oh yeah get my juices flow. Oh my God. Next up we have supplements. Now these could range from a three to a four to a five. So I just put them in four. The best supplements, I did a whole video on them up there. Yeah, there are three. They can legit actually help you make progress. However, a lot of them are in four. A lot of them aren't very well researched or the research is a little bit sketchy uh, or they just, there's no research at all. And a lot are five. They simply do nothing. Like if you've ever bought a test booster, Congratulations on your placebo effect. Sorry for ruining your placebo effect. It doesn't do shit. All right, next up, tier three, kind of a thing. These things might be worth focusing on. And first we have hydration. This, if you are dehydrated, if you're just eddy hauling it up all the time, yes, this can have a dramatic negative effect on performance. In fact, I would say if it's hot out and you have a bad workout, you were almost certainly dehydrated. If you lose even, you know, 1% or, or 2% of your body mass, that shows up in performance. Absolutely. Especially with longer workouts or higher volume workouts. So I would say, especially if you live in a hot climate, this is worth focusing on for sure. Generally speaking, I recommend two to three liters per day, but if it's hot, that might be four, five, six, or perhaps even more liters. <laughs> Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Next up, we have steroids. Yes. Yes, that's what I used for, for the marker for steroids. Could, because what else would I use? Now, these are this was actually tricky to place because it depends on your goals. If you want to be a Mr. Olympia, well, suddenly they are a one. They are absolutely crucial. However, if you just want to get in shape for the beach, well, they should be a five because they should not be necessary whatsoever for you to achieve that goal. Plus, the health consequences, well, it's just not worth it for the vast majority of people. And I would say most people who take steroids almost certainly shouldn't be taking steroids. Again, your body, your choice, whatever. But just thinking logically, if you can get to that physique naturally, 
just do it naturally. So I kind of just split the difference and put it at a three, but for most people, probably a four or a five, or at least what I would advise for it to be. Next, we have a training log. Yep, a training log. And I would say this is pretty important, and a lot of people should keep a training log. It can help keep you motivated. And how do you know what is working if you don't write it down? Don't say you're gonna remember it. What did you have for breakfast three and a half weeks ago? What about three and a half years ago? Of course you don't remember. There's just no way that the human brain can remember all this information unless you're some kind of workout savant. And I occasionally look through my training log. Not every day, that would be obsessive. Can I got a paper trail to prove it, check this out. Take a look at this. Jesus Christ. But every month or two months, I look through my training log and I say, okay, well, I look for any trends. When my deadlift was highest, what was I doing before that? When my bench press was up, what accessory movements was I including? And you need to look for these trends if you want maximum results. Just giving a shit about your training is one of the best way to actually see results. Buy my revolutionary new system called giving a shit about your training. Works wonders, works for all ages, works instantly. Next, we have the mind-muscle connection. So this varies based on the exercise. On something like, you know, a concentration curl, suddenly it's a one or a two. On something like a squat, the mind-muscle connection, it's not really a thing. Trying to squeeze your quads at the top of a squat is not only counterproductive because there's no resistance, you could hyperextend your knees. So I don't really advise that. Same thing on a leg press. And a mind-muscle connection is good, but it doesn't replace number one and two, especially for natural lifters. It is cer certainly tier, certainly tier three. Next up, we have fatigue management or the stimulus to fatigue ratio. Now, this is important, but only if you're generating a lot of stimulus and or fatigue. If you're very serious about training, you're training with higher volumes, uh, you're training with high frequency, everything is up, up, up. Yes, suddenly you want to choose movements or styles of training that have lower fatigue and higher stimulus. But if I hear one more noob who is like, yeah, I don't deadlift because the stimulus to fatigue ratio is too high or too low, I'm like, oh my, what? You're not even, you can't even deadlift 315. Where is all this fatigue coming from? It's all in your mind because you listen to these people say how bad fatigue is and how you want to optimize this ratio. For most people, Optimizing that is simply a non-factor, but it might eventually be a factor when you're stronger or you're doing higher volume or perhaps you're a little bit more beat up or you're just older, etc. So I would put this at a three. If you're a very, very advanced athlete, this might be a two or perhaps even a one. But for the vast majority of people, I would say it's a three or a four. Next, we have rep range. Now, this is similar to intensity because, you know, obviously low, lower weights are going to be higher reps and vice versa. But I would say rep range is a little bit more important because you have to think about it on an exercise by exercise basis. So I've seen programs, <clears throat> bodybuilding.com, where you're doing sets of three for lateral raises. Yeah, you're doing triples on lateral raises. That is very, very stupid. And if you're going to fuck it up that badly, bodybuilding.com, Yes, suddenly rep range is important. But other than that, I would say rep range is not as important as people think. A lot of people get hyper-focused on like, oh, 8 to 12, 8 to 10 versus 10 to 12, right? Like, oh my God, when I did 10 to 12, I got such better gains than 10 to 8 to 10. No, okay? As long as you are not messing this up on a grandiose scale, bodybuilding.com, then it's fine. Next we have... Step aerobics? What the fuck? Hold on, I need to check. I forget what picture I used. Shit. Warm-ups slash mobility. So I see people overthink this all the time. Their warm-up lasts, you know, 30 minutes or something. They think they need to do 18 different prehab movements before they start lifting. For the most part, you can just do a general warm-up. Then you can start doing the movement with light weight. Add weight over time until you get to your working sets. So, so simple. Don't overcomplicate this too much. This only really has a big impact if you are lacking in this area. So if you have tight hip flexors and it's causing you some issues in the squat, by all means, do some mobility work. But make sure it's specific and don't overdo it because a lot of people do. Next up, advanced techniques. So these are drop sets, supersets, 
uh, partials, eccentrics, all this stuff beyond failure. You can check out my book. It has a bunch on that. But I'm not going to overinflate its importance just because it's part of my book. It can help, but if you just do normal sets and you never ever go beyond failure, you can still see very, very good progress. So make sure you're doing it only occasionally and make sure it's the appropriate exercise and the appropriate time and place and effort. Next, frequency. So a year or two ago, I would have put this at probably a two. But for now, I've dropped it down to a three just because it's been shown that if volume is equated, frequency doesn't matter that much. However, in practice, higher frequencies allow you to get in a little bit more volume and a little bit better quality of volume. So if you have your 10 sets or whatever per week, doing that all in one workout, those latter sets, later sets, whatever, they tend to degrade in quality just because you're fatigued. If you spread that across two workouts or even three workouts, you can generally get a better quality of effort and a better performance, and that can definitely help progress. Next up, calories. So yeah, if you're chronically under eating, you're trying to like keep your abs or keep your shreds or you know main gain, but you're actually in a deficit because you underestimated how many calories you need, you won't see very much muscle growth. That's just the reality of it. However, you can gain muscle in a deficit under some circumstances and don't think you can just pack on a bunch of calories into your diet and gain way more muscle. Just a modest deficit is enough to gain muscle. So I would say one to 200, perhaps three to 400 in some cases if you're underweight and you're a beginner, that makes the most sense. Protein. Now, some people might put this at a one and yeah, it is absolutely crucial, but I don't see that many people who are way below the protein that they need. And most people, the limiting factor is not protein. And just having a bunch of protein powder is not gonna be the answer to get you massively better progress in the gym. Usually, the limiting factor are, well, the stuff that are actually in tier one. Next up, we have exercise selection. Now, this is definitely important, but it's also been shown in the research that you can gain muscle on a wide variety of exercises. So if you wanna build your chesticles, well, you can do a bench press, you can do dips, you can do a machine press, you can do flies, pretty much anything that works that area and you have sufficient you know, effort, sufficient everything else, it'll be fine. However, in practice, I do see a lot of people get distracted by too much exercise variation. So they go on Instagram, they see this new movement, they try it out, and this is basically the story of their lifting career. Not a good idea, not a good way to actually progress. You wanna be focused on the good movements. Which movements? Whatever is good for you. That might vary a little bit, but typically the basics are a very good starting point. Next up, we have exercise technique. Now this definitely matters, but it's also gonna be a little bit individual. And just because you're using you know, a little bit of momentum or a little bit of cheat or your technique does not look textbook or standard, that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. And I would say, in fact, trying to standardize your technique on every single lift might actually be counterproductive. However, it's certainly important for staying healthy and putting the tension in the right areas. And so I would say, especially for beginners, this is definitely worth focusing on. Next up, the enjoyment of your training. Do you like what you are doing? This is something that I ask all my clients. What exercises do you like? What exercises do you not like? And I take that into account because if you are not enjoying the process, it's gonna be very, very difficult to continue. Why is this not at a number one? Well, lots of professional athletes don't really enjoy the sport that they're doing. They do it for money because it's their job. And I see a lot of professional athletes the minute they retire, they never do that exercise again because they didn't really enjoy it. And yet, often they were absolutely jacked. So I would say it's not strictly speaking absolutely crucial, but it's certainly important, especially for the average person. Next up, we have genetics. Now, this could be at a number one, but again, it depends on your goals. If you want to be a Mr. Olympia or run 100 meters in under 10 seconds, Genetics are absolutely crucial. But if you just want to be healthy, you want to look good, or even if you just want a six pack, well, pretty much anyone can achieve those goals. And so I would say genetics are simply not that big of a factor. And a lot of people give up because they think their genetics are bad and so they don't even try. If anything, if you have bad genetics, you should try more than the average person. 
because it's actually going to keep you healthy and prevent a lot of metabolic diseases and other issues. So genetics is really not an excuse. Next, your overall volume. So this is definitely a thing and volume does matter. However, you do see people get results on lower volume, but also get results on moderate volume and high volume and super ridiculously high volume as well. So because you can get results on a wide variety of volumes, anywhere from just a few sets per week to a ridiculous 40, 50, 60 sets per week, it might not be as important as the factors in number one. It's certainly a thing and you need to take it into account and you need to know it has an interaction with all these other variables, but it's not as important as the factors in number one. All right, now we get to number one stuff that is pretty much non-negotiable. The first one is consistency. If you are not doing all of these over a long period of time, it doesn't matter. If you're applying all of these only for a week, don't expect any kind of results because muscle growth, especially naturally, takes a very long time. Someone might promise you results in 22 days, but unless you keep doing it, what's the point? All right, next, what? Oh, progressive overload, okay? Unless you are trying to get better every single workout, whether it's weight to the bar, whether it's sets, whether it's reps, whether it's improving your control, whether it's adding a pause, something, unless you're actually trying to get better, you're not actually going to be growing muscle. If you're lifting the exact same weights in the exact same way, for the exact same sets and reps and everything, a year from now, you will look exactly the same. I absolutely guarantee you that. Next, we have sleep. This is super, super important, especially if you're a natural. If you are an enhanced lifter, you can maybe get around this a little bit just because you don't have to rely on your own body's natural hormonal production. But if you're not, if you're natural, well, this is super, super important. Some people seem to get away with a little bit less sleep, but for the vast majority of people, I advocate at least seven hours. And you might see better results on eight or nine hours. If you're taking a bunch of supplements and you're shortchanging your sleep, you're shortchanging yourself. Also, you're an idiot. Next, we have effort. This is super freaking important. Again, I see a lot of people waste their money on a bunch of stuff and then half-ass their training. You won't see very robust gains unless you are busting your ass for those gains. Your effort is paramount. It is non-negotiable, especially past the beginner stage. You need to be... Come on, think of something cool. Think of something cool. Getting after it. Next, we have RPE slash RIR. Now, this is very, very close to effort, and the closer you are to failure, the higher the effort it will entail. Now, you don't necessarily need to count your RPE or RIR. I do not. However, you do have to realize that it absolutely matters. And if you're consistently keeping five, six, seven, eight reps in the tank, as a lot of people do in the gym, you won't see very, very good progress past a very initial stage. Next up, we have tension. So without tension on the muscle fiber, a muscle doesn't really have a reason to grow. It's just a machine, and tension is the main stimulus that causes a reaction which causes it to grow in the first place, okay? So it's super important, and unless you're generating a lot of tension in a muscle, don't expect any kind of gains. So in summary, be consistent, use progressive overload, Train with high efforts, somewhat close to failure. Make sure you're getting that juicy tension on the muscle. Get plenty of sleep, plenty of calories, protein, have good technique, intelligent exercise selection. Enjoy your training. Don't pick such shitty parents and use enough volume. Don't focus on massage guns, supplements, meal timing, the anabolic window, which intensity you're working on. Uh, your, if you have a training partner or not, stretching, testosterone, what tempo to use, or the bump. That is all for today. Make sure to grab a copy of my book. If you suffered through this video and somehow enjoyed it, you will definitely enjoy my book as well. It has a ton of information that will help you on your training journey. Don't forget to like the video. I know it actually helps the algorithm because I know the algorithm actually exists now, which is nice. Subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, slap around it, the bell and stuff, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.